Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name's Imani Rupert Gordon. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm the executive director for the National Center for Lesbian Rights. We're a legal organization, and we work to achieve civil and human rights for all LGBTQ people and our families. I know there's some new faces in the room, so before we get started, I wanted to share a bit more about NCLR with you. This is an amazing time for us because next year in 2022, NCLR will celebrate 45 years of service. That's 45 years of serving the most underrepresented folks in the LGBTQ movement. That's 45 years of leading by example. Something we don't always mention is that NCLR is a fraction of the size of other national LGBTQ organizations that do the same work as us. But that doesn't mean that we aren't leading. Just like our family law program built the infrastructure that supports families that were considered non-traditional, NCLR was the first national organization to have an LGBTQ specific immigration and asylum program. <clears throat> to this day, we have an unblemished record of winning 100% of our asylum cases. First, um, LGBTQ sport, the, the first to start an LGBTQ sports program. And we know how important um, this is because the policy that the NCAA uses today to support trans athletes was developed at NCAA, <clears throat> ensuring that everyone can play. We are also the first national organization to take on banning conversion therapy, and we continue to lead in that work through our Born Perfect project. And our programs like Rural Pride, the LGBTQ Anti-Poverty Network, and uh, Common Ground continue to prioritize communities within the LGBTQ community that experience the highest levels of discrimination. This helps us to create a world where everyone is supported. The LGBTQ movement has a common goal for achieving equality for all LGBTQ people. And we know that this doesn't happen at once, but like a tower, we, go str we grow stronger with each win. And each of these victories makes our next, next victory possible. So today, I'm excited to welcome you to our second installment of the NCLR Conversation Series. This is a new initiative that we're doing at NCLR, where we take a deep dive into some of our work. Um, we talk about what it means, and we hear about real life cases from the people that experienced it. Today we'll be talking about anti-discrimination and how we've seen our opponents misuse the First Amendment. Uh, you also see at the bottom that there is a, uh, a question and answer feature. If you have any questions that you want to add, um, ask the panel, please add them to the question and answer and not necessarily the chat because we won't necessarily see them. At the end, if we have time, we'll get to as many as possible. So today we are joined by an amazing panel. Asaf Orr is the Transgender Youth Project Director at NCLR. Shannon Minter is the Legal Director here at NCLR. And Julie Walensky is a Senior Staff Attorney at NCLR. And our final guest for today is Martha Danielson, who worked with NCLR on a case that she'll talk about in just a few moments. Martha, thank you so much for joining us. It's such an honor to have you. So Shannon, we're gonna start with you. This is the first time for some of the folks in the room, so I'm wondering if you could please introduce yourself and then um, start by providing some background on what we're seeing now, particularly in regards to how we're seeing um, our opponents really misuse the um, the First Amendment. Yeah, so so hi everybody, um, welcome, uh, Martha. I'm so excited that you're with us. Uh, that's going to be the best part here. So. Um, but my name is Shannon Minter. I'm the legal director of NCLR, and uh, I'm you know proud to say I've I've worked here almost 30 years now since 1993 when I started as actually a law fellow uh, to to start NCLR's youth project, which since then has just like bloomed into this kind of amazing endeavor that runs the gamut from trying to end uh, the child welfare and so-called juvenile justice systems as we know them to uh, helping transgender uh, young people and their families and to try and stop conversion therapy. Uh, I am a transgender man, uh, I'm from Texas. And one of the things that I most love about NCLR is that we're not just staffed by people from like the two coasts, but we just have this amazingly diverse staff. We've got people from Texas, um, Minnesota, Michigan, New Jersey, Hawaii, Massachusetts, um, New York, DC, 
Nicaragua, Malaysia, there's more. Um, and I just love that because I think it really helps us, you know, stay in touch with kind of what, what people across our country and to some extent across the world are really experiencing. And, you know, that's important for so many reasons, including as Imani mentioned for our asylum works, we're representing people from all over the world who, who are seeking asylum in the US. But uh, I also love that we're doing this series where as Imani said, we're we just want to take a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the most important new issues that we're seeing emerging and that NCLR is, is taking the lead on tackling. And the one today is so important, you know, and that is uh, the increasingly aggressive misuse and distortion of the First Amendment by anti-civil rights groups to try to attack anti-discrimination laws that protect LGBTQ people. Uh, I just wanted to make sure, like, to just set a little a framework here that's really important that we remember and acknowledge that historically the First Amendment has been absolutely essential to the progress of the LGBTQ movement. I mean, if it wasn't for the First Amendment, we wouldn't have LGBTQ books and magazines, we wouldn't have bars for LGBTQ people, which played a really important political role in our civil rights history. We wouldn't have uh, LGBTQ teachers or politicians. We wouldn't have gay straight alliances in the high schools. We wouldn't have LGBTQ students in our universities and you could just, the, the list could go on and on. So historically, the first amendment has really been our friend. You know, that's why it is so distressing to see anti-civil rights groups now using the first amendment and turning it into a weapon to attack protections uh, for, for our community. And I just want to say too that this, this is not new in a way. I mean, the, these, these groups and forces in our society that oppose equality, you know, they've been trying to use uh, the First Amendment to do this ever since the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I mean, from that moment on, there have been groups that have been trying to get the courts to say that there are there's some kind of free speech exception to laws that prohibit discrimination based on race or gender. But historically, the courts have always just like firmly rejected that. They have not gone down that path. And the courts have been very clear that, you know, that these laws, anti-discrimination laws, are about prohibiting discriminatory conduct, the harmful practice of discrimination. And the fact that discrimination can sometimes involve using words. I mean, for example, you could be verbally harassing someone at work or an employer could hang up a sign that said, no women need apply. Sure, that's speech, that's language, but it's, it's, it's being used to effectuate discriminatory conduct. So the fact that words are literally involved doesn't somehow magically transform that into protected First Amendment speech. But the, the troubling thing is that we are now, for the very first time in our entire history as a nation, we're seeing some courts are starting to buy into this argument and even to strike down some very important laws that prohibit discrimination against uh, LGBTQ people on the ground that supposedly these laws violate the First Amendment. Well, we've been, we've been at NCLR, we've been alert to this emerging threat for a while now. I mean, all the way back to 2010 when NCLR represented an LGBT, sorry, LGBTQ student group at Hastings Law School this is a case that went all the way up to the US Supreme Court. It's called Christian Legal Society versus Martinez. And we eked out a five to four victory over a free speech challenge to the law school's policy that said, if you want to be an officially recognized student group at this law school, you have to agree to abide by an anti-discrimination policy that you know, it included sexual orientation. So it was a really huge victory that the Supreme Court upheld that policy, rejected a free speech challenge. I'm really, really proud of, uh, of our work on that case. And then also for about the past 10 years, we've been really battling efforts to, to uh, ch on the part of these same anti-civil rights groups to challenge laws that protect minors from conversion therapy. So we've been involved now in about half a dozen lawsuits defending those laws against free speech challenges. We won them all, except very recently, we did get uh, a bad decision on this from a 11th Circuit panel. It was two, two of the three judges were appointed by President Trump. 
Uh, we've asked the entire 11th Circuit to rehear that case, and we're, we're waiting on a decision. So, you know, you get it. They've gone after student groups. They've gone after student group anti-discrimination policies, I should say. They've gone after conversion therapy laws. And now, though, and this is what we want to talk about now, we're seeing this new generation of free speech challenges to laws that protect transgender people. This is definitely kind of the new, the new legal wedge issue for the anti-civil rights movement. And we're just seeing all these lawsuits being filed all over the place, arguing that protections for transgender people, and especially protections that require transgender people to be treated respectfully when it comes to their names and pronouns, they're arguing that those laws violate other people's free speech rights. So that's like uh, the main focus for, for today. We want to share some information with you about these new cases just because it's just really important that we all understand kind of what's going on, what's at stake in these cases, the harms that these challenges are causing, and then what NCLR is doing to try to, you know, fight back against them. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, turn it back to you, Amani. Thank you so much, Shannon. Really appreciate it. Um, that was a really um, great overview of the First Amendment. I think that's important because for those of us that aren't lawyers, I think it's really helpful to, to put into context exactly what we're looking at. Um, so next, Asaf, I'm hoping that you can um, uh, continue and provide a bit more context too. Uh, Martha is about to uh, tell her story, but before, I'm wondering, Asaf, if you could introduce yourself and give um, a little bit of background so that um, the audience can understand the context that we're in uh, for Martha's story. Thanks, Imani. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Asaf Moore. I'm a senior staff attorney and director of the Transgender Youth Project. Um, as you can probably tell from my title, I work on trans youth cases, uh, a wide range of them from discrimination in schools and healthcare to family law cases, custody cases involving transgender young people. Um, and the case I wanted to just quickly introduce before Martha gets to tell her story is several years ago, all of a sudden there was this huge splash in the media about a French teacher who was being fired for refusing to use a transgender student's pronouns. And you know, as Shannon mentioned, these are cases that we've been monitoring and wanting to uh, participate in to make sure that courts really get them right uh, because these are complex issues. And again, we wanted to make sure that the voices of transgender young people are heard. And so we uh, thankfully were able to get in touch with Martha and her family uh, and represent them in what became uh, Mr. Vlaming's lawsuit against the school district uh, for requiring him to comply with their anti-discrimination policy. Uh, and when he refused to uh, use um, treasurer students' correct pronouns, uh, he was terminated. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to you, Amani, to introduce Martha and have her tell her story. Thanks so much for that, Asaf. Um, Martha, thank you so much for being here with us and for allowing NCLR to be part of your story. I'd love if you could take the time right now to share your story with the audience. Thanks again for being here. Thank you, Amani, and thank you, um, Asaf, and everybody for having me. Um, so just to give a little background, um, I have a transgender son who is now 17. Um, he began to transition at the end of eighth grade. So he was 14 at the time. Um, he attends school in West Point, Virginia and um, very small rural school, um, rural little town, but they've got an excellent school system. Um, so at the end of eighth grade, um, when James came out, he had a particular uh, French teacher that um, he had had previously before transitioning. So Mr. Vlaming knew my child as Bella and um, had made a comment several times to my husband and I um, when we would be at the school for various reasons, you know, how much he thought of Ella and what a unique student and just, just a real pleasure to have in class. It was definitely, we definitely got the sense that he really cared about our child. Um, and 
so at the end of eighth grade, when James came out, um, he asked that he be, uh, go by his chosen name, which was James, and um, use he, him pronouns. And so that summer leading up to ninth grade, I happened to be at the school and Mr. Blaming was, came into the office and he said, um, he said, would you be willing to meet with me prior to school starting? I just wanna know how I can best support James and, um, and your family. And I thought, you know, this is great. This is a teacher who is on board. This is, you know, very interested in what they can do to ensure a safe, positive learning atmosphere. Um, so I met with, with Mr. Blaming and um, the new guidance counselor at the school. And I explained to him that this was a very new journey for us as well. And, but we had learned a few things. And one of those things was um, using a child's given uh, chosen name and particularly your pronouns that, um, and I can't remember the exact statistic, but it cuts suicidal ideation almost in half. Um, so it, it is vitally important. And the whole time I'm, I'm giving them this information, he seems very receptive. And um, again, it, it, it made me feel very good that, that he was you know, taking these steps to, to hopefully ensure a good classroom atmosphere. So school started and um, there were a few times that he would mess up the pronouns. Um, and James has always been, and I think obviously not speaking for the whole transgender community, but with the folks that I've met, these kids, as long as you're trying and you make an attempt, and if you mess up, it's okay, just correct yourself and move on. Um, I think the kids understand, and, and it, it does take some getting used to. It, at home, it took a lot of getting used to for our family, um, but he just continually had um, these episodes where he would misgender James. Um, he didn't have as much problem using James's given uh, chosen name, but the pronouns really seemed to be a sticking point, and um, there were also, uh, there was an incident where um, my older daughter also went to the school at the time and um, one of her friends happened to overhear Mr. Blaming. Um, apparently James had left his phone in the classroom and he uh, referred to James by his old name and the incorrect pronouns. And this student, um, made James aware of it. She said, I don't know if you know that this is happening, but um, Mr. Blaming is using your, you know, your dead name and incorrect pronouns. And so James, um, he's a pretty straightforward guy. And he said, you know, I, I want to talk to him about this. And my husband and I reminded him, you know, that's fine, but just be respectful. You're still speaking with a teacher. And so he emailed him and let him know that there was some things going on that he would like to talk to him about. And so they met after school. And um, when James, when I picked him up from school that day, and he said, you know, it, it went pretty well. He said he did actually come out and say that the reason that he was having the issues was um, a religious reason. And so, um, you know, James felt okay about the conversation that they had had. Um, no real resolution, but I think being able to speak his mind and let Mr. Blaming know how it was affecting him. Um, that afternoon, I received a call from Mr. Blaming and um, the conversation got pretty heated. Um, and he came out and asked me if I thought um, gender and sexuality were the same thing. And I said, no, I don't believe they're the same thing. Um, and basically just came out and said, I have a real problem because of my religious convictions and views to use James's pronouns. He said, I will use his name, but I will not use the pronouns. And 
obviously that didn't sit very well with me. Um, it would be very odd for a teacher to constantly call that student by name and not use pronouns. I mean, it's how we speak, it's normal language. Um, so I, I, at one point in the conversation, kind of cut him off and said, you know what, we need to get administration involved because we're going in circles, nobody's changing their mind. Um, you're clearly failing to see the importance and the value of using these pronouns and his name and what that will do for him. So um, the next day we got administration involved and thankfully um, they were extremely supportive from the get-go. There was another incident in the classroom a couple weeks after that. Um, they had met with him, administration met with him and told him you will you know, use this child's pronouns, he, him. And he continued to refuse and the, inc the um, incident in the classroom, they were doing a virtual uh, assignment where they had goggles on and they were paired up um, two in twos. And James was paired up with a student who had not known James before. So this student knew James as James. And uh, James had the goggles on and was getting ready to hit the wall. Um, and Mr. Blaming yells out in the middle of the class, you know, stop her and don't let her hit the wall. And the student who James was paired with, she looked at him and she was like, did he just call you her? So clearly he did not understand that he had just outed my child, you know, and potentially caused a very um, uncomfortable, you know, potentially dangerous situation for James. Um, and so after that incident, I went to the principal and I said, um, I don't want James in this classroom anymore. Unfortunately, because it is such a small school, he is the only French teacher. Um, and I said, you know, whatever we have to do classroom wise to work it out, I just don't want him in that environment because I knew that it wasn't a safe learning environment for him. And, um, and after that, they placed him on administrative leave and um, ended up eventually firing him. And of course, in a small rural town, they didn't take too kindly to all of this. And, you know, it just became a huge spectacle. Um, and it's hard enough, I think, for kids to go to school and just go about the day to day. And then you go to school and you've got these students who are blaming James for what's happening and, um, you know, blaming our family that he was fired. And we never asked for him to be fired. Um, we just, you know, as parents, we're there to protect our child. We're not gonna allow him to stay in an environment that was unhealthy and unsafe. Um, and thank goodness the school board, um, all of the administration has been 100% behind us and very supportive. And it, it was quite a, a, a relief. And, and it came as a little bit of a surprise because again, in a small rural area, um, it was just nice to have such progressive thinking people that would acknowledge that this is important and this student deserves to be treated with respect. And it doesn't matter who Mr. Blaming knew before. Um, and at one point he even told James, you know, this is really hard for me. I, I miss who you were. And it, it, he made it so much about him and just failed to see that this isn't about any of us. This is about a child living authentically who they are and you being not allowing that to happen in your classroom can be very, very dangerous for our child. So it, um, it, it's been quite a few years, obviously. Um, things have calmed down now and um, James is got through three years of French and, um, came out just fine. And he's a very resilient kid and um, has taught us all a whole lot. And I'm just lucky I get to be his mom. Oh my goodness. Martha, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you for your bravery. I mean, 
the difference it makes in a child's life when you have a parent that believes in them, let alone supporting them through a process like this. I just want to thank you for your leadership. Um, you're making a difference for children everywhere, and you're making the world better, and you're making it safer for all of us. Um, you're appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for, for listening. Oh my goodness, the, the pleasure really is ours. Um, Asaf, I wanted to go back to you, and I was hoping that you could give us an update on what's happening uh, in this case now, and also share with us um, the other work that you're doing in this area. Sure, thank you. Well, thankfully, we were able to work with the school district in representing uh, the Danielson family, and we're able to get uh, Mr. Vlamy's complaint dismissed at the trial court. Uh, the trial court, you know, agreed that um, you, Mr. Vlamy did not have a free speech right uh, or a free exercise right to discriminate against uh, James in class and to not use pronouns when referring to him, which as Martha mentioned, would be super awkward, especially in any class, but particularly in a language class like French where many words are, or all words, I don't speak French, are gendered. Um, and so, you know, I, I think um, obviously uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is the anti-civil rights group that is representing Mr. Vlaming is appealing that uh, decision and you know will soon be filing its first brief with the Virginia Supreme Court, um, and we'll continue to to follow that. Um, you know, unfortunately, Virginia has become a little bit of a hotbed for these issues. There's another lawsuit also filed by the Alliance Defending Freedom on this exact same issue, um, and you know there's and at the same time, Virginia, the Department of Education, is really trying to move the state forward and develop a really uh, excellent model policy for working with transgender students in schools and school districts are now having to adopt uh, either that policy or develop their own, uh, which has caused um, a lot of uh, very heated uh, Board of Education meetings throughout Virginia. Um, so this is something we're, we're continuing to watch the situation in Virginia. Uh, but Imani, as you mentioned, we're also doing other work in this area. We have another case um, in Ohio uh, called Merriweather versus Hartop. Um, in that case, uh, Professor Merriweather is a, a philosophy professor uh, who had a transgender student in his class, a transgender student he had never met before, and just presumed that she was transgender. And um, in the first class that they had, uh, refused to use the correct pronouns uh, and referred to uh, our client, Jane Doe, as he. Um, much like James, uh, Jane thought, oh, well, it was just an, it was an honest, honest mistake. And she went up to him after class, who's like, actually, I'm female, and I need you to respect who I am and use female pronouns when referring to me and honorifics uh, as well. He was a big believer in the Socratic method, so he referred to everyone as Mr. and Ms. Uh, when calling on them. And Mr. Fleming refused. And um, she continued to ask him to, um, to be respectful and he would not do it. And she then went and complained to the administration. And you know, he decided he would come up with this compromise that he would just not use pronouns when referring to her, he, but he would continue to use honorifics and, and everything else with everybody else. And again, just like with James, that very much singles her out. Um, and eventually the school uh, said, you can't do this, and ultimately decided to discipline him. And they put in uh, a disciplinary letter in his file. And he sued, saying that I have a free speech and free uh, freedom of religion right to uh, exempt myself from this anti-discrimination provision. And what is actually particularly scary about this lawsuit is it not only says that I have a right, meaning Mr. Uh, Dr. Merriweather, but also that you cannot have a, an anti-discrimination policy that protects transgender students that can be squared with the First Amendment and really seeking to ensure that no university could adopt the policy uh, and have it be uh, valid 
uh, or have it not violate the First Amendment. Um, although we were initially able to get his complaint dismissed as well at the district court level, um, uh, Dr. Merriweather appealed and was able to get it reinstated by the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which covers uh, Michigan, Ohio, and Tennessee. And, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, that, that panel believed that he might have a First Amendment uh, claim here. Uh, thankfully, uh, there are still some, the, the court left some open questions and we're now uh, in discovery, you know, finding out all the facts and we're going to be doing depositions. And again, um, we'll be able to demonstrate uh, after, after that concludes that, Mr., that uh, Dr. Merriweather does not have any First Amendment claim. Uh, he cannot exempt himself uh, from generally you know, applicable anti-discrimination protections. Um, and I think the other piece of this too, and we pointed this out in our briefing, is that if he's allowed to discriminate against transgender students based on his religious beliefs, there is no bottom, right? And I think it's correct that, that Shannon refers to these groups as anti-civil rights groups, because if he can do this to transgender students, there's no stopping him from doing it to female students, to students of color, and saying, I have a religious right. Uh, and, you know, sadly, these organizations are not really engaging with that. They're just saying, oh, well, I'm not racist. I'm not sexist. I wouldn't do those things. Um, but I'm sure uh, that for those communities, that is uh, barely cold comfort. Um, and so we are going to continue to litigate these cases, not only to protect the right of transgender students uh, and transgender people more broadly to live their lives and be treated with the dignity and respect that all people deserve, uh, but also because it would uh, seriously um, harm the First Amendment and our ability to have the, the kind of civil society that uh, and equal society that we are all striving to create. Thank you so much for, for that, Asaf, and for um, that tie in there. This is, um, it's important, it's the right thing, and it's literally saving lives. So really appreciate you. Um, Julie, you have some work that ties in here as well, and I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about the taking offense challenge to the California law with us. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Julie Walensky. I use she, her pronouns, and as Amandi mentioned, I'll talk a little bit about the taking offense case, which is before the California Supreme Court. Um, that case involves a free speech challenge to a California law protecting LGBTQ people in long-term care facilities. And it's an important case to watch because it could have potential implications for non-discrimination law, both here in California and beyond. Um, first, I'll give some background on the case and the law that it's challenging. The case was brought by a group called Taking Offense, and it challenges part of a law called the LGBT Long-Term Care Facility Residence Bill of Rights. This is a California law that was passed um, in 2017. It's one of the first of these kinds of laws in the country. And it has various provisions that require equal treatment of LGBTQ long-term care residents. Um, for example, it ensures that residents can access restrooms um, in these facilities consistent with their gender identity. It also prohibits facilities and their staff from willfully and repeatedly misusing a resident's name or pronouns because of the resident's sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. And the reason for this law is that is to address um, pervasive discrimination against LGBTQ elders, particularly in long-term care facilities. And the long-term care setting is a unique space for discrimination um, because it's both a health facility and a home and residents rely on staff for care. In terms of who's involved in the case, uh, we know almost nothing about the taking offense group. Um, in the lawsuit, it describes itself as an unincorporated association with at least one California citizen and taxpayer. So we don't know who's in the group or whether it has any connection to these facilities or their staff. And unlike the cases you heard about that um, involve particular students and particular teachers or professors, um, this group brought a lawsuit seeking to invalidate the provision about names and pronouns kind of just as a question of law. So there aren't any particular employees or particular people who work in these facilities. It's really just the organization that brought the case. And, it are, and they're arguing that the provision on names and pronouns violates um, employees' right to free speech. So um, what happened with the case is that taking offense brought the lawsuit. 
and the California Attorney General is defending the law. The trial court rejected the free speech claim and then taking offense appealed. In a surprising decision um, in July, a court of appeal held that the provision violates the right to freedom of speech. So this decision, if allowed to stand, could have potential implications on non-discrimination law more generally. Um, we were at NCLR, we were pleased that the California Attorney General asked the state Supreme Court to review the case. And we played um, a leading role in coordinating letters from a variety of stakeholders to support the Attorney General in urging the state Supreme Court to review the case. Uh, we also submitted our own letter with Lambda Legal on behalf of Equality California and a coalition of California local and national organizations in support of the Attorney General's petition for review. And um, one of the things that our letter does is explain that the Court of Appeal really failed to appreciate just how harmful intentionally misusing names and pronouns is, and that it happens in many settings, and is especially harmful in long-term care facilities, where LGBTQ elders depend on staff to care for them. So um, in terms of what's happening currently in the case, last week on November 10th, the California Supreme Court agreed to hear the case. So it, it will proceed to the merit stage, and we anticipate filing an amicus brief in support. And this case is an important one to watch because it has potential implications for non-discrimination law in California and beyond. And also the California Supreme Court is a, is a very well-respected court across the country. And so getting a good decision from it on these issues could be a real game changer. With that, I'll turn it back to Amani. Julie, thank you so much for sharing. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, I appreciate all of you. I appreciate you sharing your brilliance with us today. I also want to give um, a, a special thanks to Martha. Thank you so much uh, for being us for for being here for joining us today. Um, we appreciate your strength. We appreciate your courage. You're absolutely amazing. Um, it's a pleasure to be in community with you. You're making the world better for all of us. So thanks. Um, finally, uh, if you learned something today. You can find out more uh, about the work that we do at NCLR on our website at nclrights.org. And also, if you're so inclined, you can make a gift to NCLR. Uh, it's a kickoff to our Justice Act Access and Equity campaign. Your investment is being matched dollar, by, uh, dollar for dollar from the Fairline T. Powell Fund that allows us to do more. So if you make your gift right now, uh, it'll be doubled. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. One of my favorite um, quotes is by Maya Angelou, and she says, I did then what I knew best. When I knew better, I did better. I look forward to doing better with each of you. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much. <laughs>